All right. So today we have Christopher Cousins, who will tell us about holographic duels of Argyris Douglas theories. Take it away. Yeah, thank you for having me and setting this up. Um, so I'm going to talk about some work I've been doing over the last two years. Um, some of it is with Craig, who's in the audience, and uh, others with uh, collaborators in Korea. So Hugh Jong and Nakru Kim, uh, Yane Lee, who's on the market, postdoc market at the moment, uh, Peter Bowman's in Oxford, and a former PhD student in Oxford, Siru Ning. Uh, and finally, uh, with Monica uh, Jinwoo Kang in the final one. So I'm going to break tradition and do mostly gravity rather than uh, quiver stuff or field theory stuff. Uh, I hope you forgive me. Um, but what I think is very interesting is that these Argyris Douglas theories for uh, a while, you wouldn't have expected so much that you could get uh, some nice holographic jewels. And they have some funky. Uh, properties, but it, they seem to be very powerful. And one of the nice things is I can make connections to uh, a talk you had two weeks ago by uh, Palash Singh, where we can see what he was talking about during his talk, and it's very simple in gravity. So the hopefully the take home message I want to tell you is that uh, this gravity realization of these Algeria's Douglas theories is actually quite nice, and it could probably hopefully start saying stuff beyond what is known at, with field theory at the moment. So these solutions that I'm going to talk about uh, came into this, uh, we, I would call them a disk, and they're kind of uh, one of the same type of family as something else you may have heard recently called spindles. So I'll explain these uh, very shortly, uh, but the reason why these are interesting is they appear as horizons of black objects. And one of the nice things about them is that they don't have constant curvature metrics, which is the typical uh, situation that we have. And they have many other interesting properties. Uh, one of them is that typically when you have these uh, flows, uh, you have some generic Riemann surface in your UV theory with some arbitrary uh, deformation. And what happens is when you flow along this uh, RG flow to the IR, all these deformations get uh, wiped out and you end up with just the usual constant curvature uh, metric. So these are these uniformization theorems. And these spindles and disks actually evade these kinds of theorems because you end up with this non-constant curvature metrics. And the way they do this is uh, somewhat subtle. It's that in field theory, when you do these uniformization theorems, the idea you should have there is that you're, what you're doing is you're doing a topological twist. And these new solutions uh, preserve supersymmetry in a different way. And uh, I will discuss this very shortly, uh, but these this different way uh, involves you having to twist the R symmetry with the rotational symmetry of the compactification manifold that you're uh, uh, compactifying on. So these metrics also have other properties and these uh, they have this uh, conical singularities at points in these, uh, in these spaces. So they're really orbifolds. And even worse, uh, the disk has something which would, you would say is a very bad singularity. And it has genuinely uh, something very singular and if you just look at this in some gauge supergravity, you'd be tempted just to throw this solution away. But once you uplift this, you can actually interpret this singularity as something uh, very physical, uh, which is a stack of smeared M5 brains. And this is really going to play this role of this irregular puncture in this uh, AD theories. So uh, I'm going to try to tell you what holography can tell you about these SCFTs, uh, and in particular, uh, these Argyris Douglas theories of uh, class S. So to begin, I just explain what a spindle is, because uh, it's not super obvious, but you can be very mathematical and just call it a weighted projective CP1, where you have these two weights, N plus and N minus. So this is just the usual uh, CP1 if you set n plus and equals n minus. But the role of these two uh, integers, n plus and n minus, is to basically lead to conical singularities at the poles of uh, your original two-sphere. 
So the one thing you can compute very easily is the Euler characteristic. And what you get is what you'd expect. You get the two from the usual S2. Then you get contributions from each of these conical defects. And uh, what you end up with is this nice result, which is one over N plus plus one over N minus. So you may have some objections that this is uh, not integer, uh, but since we're dealing with orbifolds, uh, this non-integerness uh, goes away. And really what we need is that um, something is integer uh, up to multiplying by n plus n minus, which indeed this is. So the first example of these uh, solutions with spindles uh, came in this paper by Ferrero, Gauntlet, Epina, Martelli, and Sparks in late uh, two, 2020. And since then, there have been uh, countless other papers dealing with spindles in various different uh, uh, supergravity theories. So at the moment, there's uh, spindle solutions for M5 brains compactified to them, D3s, M2s, uh, basically you name it, and there's probably some uh, spindle solution that's been found so far. The one uh, funky thing, though, is that we may have all these supergravity solutions, but we know we don't have a single uh, field theory dual for these uh, spindles. There is some work on doing localization on uh, these spindles, localization compensations on these spindles, but from the field theory perspective, nothing has actually been worked out for these spindles. A disk is slightly different. So it looks like I took the spindle and just chopped this in half. And I have, again, some conical singularity at this point. So we have so this R2 mod ZK overfold. But at the other end, what we end up with is something that looks topologically like a cylinder. And we have this red line here, which is some boundary. So the metric for this space itself is not singular. Uh, but in the full solution, this boundary basically introduces some singularities into the 11D solution that we'll look at. But I'll explain this a bit uh, later. So again, you can compute something simple, the Euler characteristic, and again, you have something which you'd expect. You have the two from the usual S2, you have the contribution from this conical singularity, and then you have this minus one because of the boundary. And you get this nice one over K. So the first solution of these disks was found in this paper by Barbonetti, Minassian, and Nardoni uh, in 2021, so a few months after this spindle paper. And you can realize these solutions, spindles and disks, in kind of the same manner. They're different global completions of the same uh, local solutions. Uh, so I'll go through this tiny bit later. Uh, but the thing to take away is that uh, they're kind of very similar related. And in the case of the disks, typically what you have is more supersymmetry. When you get this disk, you have to basically take some parameter, which basically enhances supersymmetry. So since this first one, there's been plenty of others. Uh, I've probably forgotten some names here, so I apologize, but uh, it's been uh, quite active in the last couple of years. So the, the idea we want to have now is that really we want to look at some uh, field theory, some SCFT, and we want to place our theory on these disks uh, or spindles. So the typical way is we have this RD times this RD minus P times MP, where we take MP to be some compact space that we want to eventually shrink to zero size. And if we want to preserve supersymmetry in doing this, and if MP has some non-trivial curvature, we have to do some form of twist uh, on, on our theory. So the, the formal way of doing this is we couple to do supergravity, background supergravity, we put it on uh, the manifold we have, take this rigid limit to uh, decouple gravity. And what we end up with is some killing spinner equations, uh, which typically have some form like this. And we need to make this vanish. So this fixes us to basically take particular choices of this uh, gauge field here, M, and this matrix M here, which is uh, dependent on some scalars in your theory. So for us, we're gonna pick this P equals two. So it's this spindle or this disc. Uh, and just for simplicity, let's just set this second term just to zero. So we just have this nice first term. And then we all know uh, how to actually do uh, this twist is the, the canonical way of doing it, which is this topological twist. So what you see is that the Killing spinner equation that you have in your d-dimensional theory 
now reduces to one which is basically along uh, the RD minus P here and one which is along MP. And the one along this, the flat piece is just trivial. I just have it's the derivative along this spinner on these directions is uh, vanishes. So I just take a constant spinner here. And the other one is uh, slightly non-trivial and I turn on some gauge field here, this A mu. And the, the, the typical way of solving it with this topological twist is to equate your spin connection on this uh, Riemann surface with this gauge field uh, A mu up to some signs. Uh, and you take the spinner on this uh, um, Remus, uh, the, the components of the spinner to basically have some projection conditions. So this will tell you whether you have chiral, anti-chiral, uh, uh, SUSY preserve roughly depending on the dimensions. But this is now a very simple way of uh, solving it. And it is pretty much always the one that you use. Uh, and a direct consequence of this is that if you look at the integral of this, the, the flux of this, this gauge field, you find that it equals exactly uh, the Euler characteristic. And it's actually, uh, because there's an equality, it's actually stronger than this. It's, they actually equal as uh, uh, gauge fields as well without actually doing the integral. But this isn't the only way to do twists. And the, the interesting twists for these spindles and disks is that again, you can compute something very similar. You can compute this flux th threading through this uh, spindle disk with this gauge field. And what you find is this uh, quantity here. And it turns out that there are two choices. There's this paper by Ferrero, Gornet and Sparks, which tell you that uh, of these two choices, you pick sigma equals plus or minus one. They're called the twist when it's sigma equals one. And the integral of uh, this, this flux through this spindle is actually equal to the Euler characteristic. So it mimics the topological twist. Whereas for sigma equals minus one, it is something very different. This is what's called the anti-twist. And the flux through the spindle does not equal the Euler characteristic. So this leads to uh, something slightly different. The picture you should have here is you have some uh, uh, brains wrapping these uh, spindle inside some special holonomy manifold for the twist case only. In the anti-twist, this is no longer something Ritchie flat. Uh, so the curvature basically does not get cancelled off by fibering your manifold with this gauge field A. For the disks, there's something very uh, similar. Again, you compute this flux uh, through the disk and you find it's equal to the Euler characteristic minus some delta Z, which is basically never zero. So you see that it's again, not this usual topological twist. And the smoking signature of this kind of different twist is that when you actually compute the R symmetry in the, the, the field theory or the gravity solution, what you see is that the parent theory uh, R symmetry gets twisted and mixed with the uh, isometries of this spindle or disc. So this is something which is an, uh, the same, which doesn't occur for these topological twists, but it's something very novel for these twists, uh, for these spindles and disks. But for those people who are familiar with Argyros Douglas theories, this probably doesn't look so strange where you have to rotate, where you have to twist your R symmetry with rotations of your compactification space. So we're gonna, uh, look at some theories of class S. So Palash gave a nice uh, introduction two weeks ago. Uh, I won't be as, as clear or as detailed, but the rough idea is we have this kind of picture here where we've taken our 6D theory with our M stack of M5 brains. This has some ADE classification and we're just going to wrap this 6D theory on some Riemann surface of genus G with some N punctures. Uh, and these end punctures could be twisted, so we introduce these twist lines. Uh, but uh, there's a, a different class of what we can do. And what we hope is that if we do this correctly, this flows to some 4D n equals 2 SCFT, uh, which has this U1 times SU2 uh, R symmetry. So we can label these theories by the type of 6D theory that we started with, so this ADE classification the Riemann surface that we compactified on, the punctures, 
this puncture data here and any twist lines, this little O. So in this picture here, these little uh, punctures correspond to having M5 brains intersecting this Rima surface at single points. Uh, so they're lines in four, uh, five of the same directions as this original brain and then uh, uh, touching on this Rima surface here. So there are plenty of examples that you can do in this class S uh, story. Uh, so there's the famous TN theory and the one that we're going to look at today are these Arturus Douglas theories uh, of class S. So these aren't the only ways of getting uh, Arturus Douglas theories. Uh, so they're, they're kind of special for dn equals two SCFTs, uh, where they have some Coulomb branch operators, operators which have fractional dimension. And one consequence of this is that you don't have this n nice n equals two Lagrangian description. You can sometimes get some nice n equals one Lagrangian description, but it's not clear that this is always the case. Uh, it's not always the case. Um, but there's different multiple ways of realizing them. So the old story is really you look in uh, Coulomb branches from Susie Gage fields, and there are some fixed, uh, some certain points of this. Uh, or the more recent ones, which is you can engineer them in type 2b using geometric engineering on some singular uh, Clavier threefolds. Or the example that we want to consider today is this class S uh, realization uh, from the previous slide. So to fully understand these, what we can do is we can take our 6D uh, theory and what we want to end up with is this 4D n equals 2 theory after compact final on the C. But there's a, uh, a nice way of trying to understand these theories, which is by using these 3D n equals 4 SCFTs that you get by further compactifying this uh, 4D theory on a circle. You can also go the other way. So you first compactify the circle to get 5D n equals 2 super young mills, and then further compactify this down to 3D on the same uh, Rima surface here. And the nice story that you have now is that everything can be determined for this 4D theory in terms of some Hitchin system living on this uh, Riemann surface here, which depends basically on these two things, this gauge field A and this 1,0 form phi, both living on C, which satisfy Hitchin's equations, uh, these last two here. So you can now ask what types of uh, solutions can you get to these uh, Hitchin Higgs field uh, phi. And what you find is that there's these regular type ones where this phi has a single uh, pole at Z, which Z is the coordinate on your uh, Remus surface. And these are these regular punctures. And you can classify these by some young diagram, which is giving you this uh, some nice uh, flavor symmetry. The second type is this uh, irregular or wild, and we're going to focus on this type one theory, which uh, Palash also mentioned two weeks ago, where rather than having just a single uh, pole at z equals zero, uh, where this puncture is located, it has some high order pole with b and p some positive integers. And t here is some uh, semi-simple uh, uh, nilpotent uh, element uh, of with the the Langlands dual of the gauge uh, algebra you took from your 6D theory. So if you have just regular punctures, uh, there are some constraints, but they're quite mild. So you need to have, if you have genus uh, zero, you need to have at least three punctures. If it's genus one, you need uh, at least one puncture. And if it's any higher genus, you can basically do whatever you want. With the with the including in the irregular, there's a far more stringent uh, constraints, and the constraints come essentially because uh, the complex coordinate z of this Riemann surface that you have uh, has to have uh, be twisted with this R symmetry, and this forces you into having a, a CP one. And again, you still you have to preserve this R this U one symmetry. So it forces you to only be allowed to have two punctures, one being irregular at the pole, one being regular at the other pole. So you can further extend this. Uh, you can add in twisted punctures. So these would be uh, lines basically uh, going from one with some monodromy around them. Or you could do something uh, different with these irregular type punctures. And this one is you can do something called a type three puncture, 
where rather than having just a single T, you have T, you have some nested sets of these Ts. And this is kind of a, a larger class than this type one, uh, but it's a lot more complicated uh, than this type one. So after all of this, uh, what you end up with is basically five different theories, which you can then also uh, perform some nilpotent Higgsian on. But these are the five, uh, basically, families of these type one theories that we care about. And it's labeled by this J, which is part of the Lie algebra of your, uh, your um, simple laced, uh, simple, simply laced uh, Lie algebra from your 60 theory. These O living giving you these uh, outer automorphisms. This is the lang lang dual of this J. And these Bs and Ps are these parameters which appear in the roots of the pole uh, here in Z. And this O is telling you what's happening at this regular puncture, whether you've got the full maximal puncture or you've Higgsed it somehow. So the original flavor symmetry is this, uh, where this G is the same here, this lang lang dual. Uh, and you can also get some flavor symmetry for these type one theories from this irregular puncture, dependent on the number of uh, mass parameters that you have. For us, uh, this U1 won't play a role. We can't really capture this very well in gravity, um, which is slightly a shame, but uh, for us, this U1 here won't play any role. Um, but now we can do fun things, which is perform these null potent Higgs in on this F. And if you started with some maxwell puncture, you can end up with some uh, puncture of uh, N, uh, which is of this form I to the MI. In general, for this uh, A series one, there are no constraints on what you can do with this partition. But for these others, uh, so these A's with twisted, you have some either a C partition or a B partition. And for the D's uh, with, with or without uh, this uh, out to automorphism twist, you also have conditions on what types of partitions are allowed. So I'm going to begin talking about this first row, the holographic jewel here, where it's this nice A series one. And then at the end, I'll talk about very quickly uh, how to extend it to these classes. And the interesting bit there is that you can actually see that the requirements that you need these different partitions for N from gravity with these, uh, with our setup. Are there any questions? I guess this is all familiar to everyone uh, here. Uh, so let me just uh, uh, go on with the supergravity, uh, but please stop me if you have any questions at all. Okay. So we want uh, some holographic jewels of our 4D N equals two theories. So what we should have is some ADS5 solutions in 11D. And fortunately, fortunately, these have been classified uh, long ago by Lin, Lun, and Maldesena. And there are some further refinements by uh, Gaeta and Maldesena. So you have to suffer a few metrics. Uh, this is the first one. So you have just your nice 11D space with you have your ADS5, you have the S2, which is the geometrizing this SU2 R symmetry. And then you have this 4D space here, which includes some U1 fibered over some 3D. Uh, 3D space. And the nice thing is that everything in this solution is determined by this potential D, which satisfies this nonlinear uh, SU infinity total equation. So given a solution to this, you can basically reconstruct uh, any, uh, basically reconstruct fully this solution that you have. But the total equation is uh, very non-trivial to actually solve. Uh, so what we typically want to do is make our lives easier and we can assume extra symmetry. So we can take this 2D Riemann surface here and impose that there's actually a U1 symmetry in here. And if you do this, uh, what you can do is you can do this something called a Backlund transformation. It's not the prettiest transformation, but what you end up with is this much simpler metric uh, and rather than having this nonlinear total equation to solve, what you end up solving is this nice linear Laplace equation uh, in a uh, cylindrical Laplace equation in 3D. So now because it's linear, if I give you, if you give me one solution, I can basically generate further ones by just using uh, superposition. And this is indeed the trick that we're going to use to try and get these uh, holographic jewels of these Argyris-Douglas theories. 
So given some V, you can define something uh, called this lambda of beta, which is some derivative of this uh, V dot here is a derivative with respect to um, rho. And then you set this rho equals zero. And this thing here is uh, called the line charge. Uh, and it, it appears basically line charge in electrostatics theory, but we can uh, ignore this. But this can basically encode all of the information you want about the solution up to specifying some boundary conditions for the domain of rho and eta. So with the reason why this is very nice is because you have this linear line charge, which is basically piecewise uh, linear. Um, and Goethe and Madesena tell you some rules about how you can construct the dual quiver for, these given, uh, for a given line charge. So the first requirement is that this starts off at zero. Um, and then you keep it as piecewise linear. Uh, and the jumps that you're allowed are precisely at integer values uh, along this eta axis. So they ask that you have imposed both RA's integer and MA's integer, so both the slope and the constant piece of these uh, pieces, uh, both linear. And that if you take the difference of these changes of slope, it's something positive. So these LA's will basically become, uh, give rise to the flavor symmetries. These kinks are going to basically, if you take the reduction to 2A, these will give you D6 brains, and these will give the flavors to your theory. So the rule to actually construct a quiver is now at every integer value of this eta, you compute lambda of n. Uh, this becomes a color group in your quiver. And at every uh, kink, you have a flavor symmetry of rank uh, LA. So given some line charge like this, you can basically construct a nice linear quiver uh, describing this uh, theory. So typically what you'd have is that rather than these line charges coming and becoming finite, the usual way was to consider these which go on to infinity. And these would really describe if I take uh, some, uh, some higher genus Riemann surface, I look very locally around a puncture, I end up with some infinitely long uh, tail because this, this quiver isn't really a CFT. And this would be described by some line charge which basically tends to infinity. Uh, with some slope zero at some point. What we're going to be interested in is in uh, some slopes which basically terminate at some point. Um, but we have some kind of issues to solve. And the first one is that if I give you this line charge, apparently guys tell Madasena tell me I can draw a quiver for this. And we know that these uh, Argyrus Douglas theories are non-Lagrangian, so there's clearly something to understand there. Moreover, we have the correct R symmetry for these theories, but we also introduce this extra U1, which, which becomes the flavor symmetry in uh, the field theory. But we know that this flavor symmetry is not one of these U1Fs from the irregular puncture. It's something else, which you basically imposed by hand. And what we find is that actually this is actually a broken symmetry in the field theory, but we somehow have some remnant of it in uh, the gravity solution. So this will be problem two to solve. And the final one is that this is all working for SU uh, gauge and flavor nodes. But if we really want to describe the other uh, DP theories where it's not uh, the A series, then we really need to understand also how to put SO and USP uh, nodes in these types of quivers. So these are the problems that we're going to solve. And these were solved in basically three different uh, papers uh, uh, to, uh, that I wrote. So the original solution by BBMN is takes this form. So you can construct it in 7D U1 squared gauge supergravity, which is a truncation uh, of the maximal 7D SO5, which you obtain by compactifying 11D on an S4. And the solution is quite simple. You just have your ADS5, and then it depends on basically this function f and this h here. And you can give the solution, it is completely very simple, that w, this hi's that appear in h and f are just uh, quadratic with a constant piece. So generically, this will pre preserve n equals 1 supersymmetry. 
And if you want n equals two, you basically need to trivialize uh, uh, one of these functions by setting one of the constants to zero. And this will enhance supersymmetry to n equals two. The cost of this is that rather than having something nice uh, here, uh, which is completely non-singular up to conical singularities, you basically have to fix uh, an endpoint here, which is w equals zero. So we want to consider this part of the metric here and how to actually complete this globally. And we end up having to bound it by looking at uh, points where this circle parameterized by these edge strings. So there's lots of different choices. There's the spindles and the disks that we talk about. There's some also some more exotic uh, things that uh, we don't really know what are what they are. But what we end up doing is we bound it between zero and some root here of this function uh, f of w. And what happens is this locally at these two different points looks like r2 minus zk when we go to this w equals w minus, and this r times s1 or the cylinder when we go to w equals zero. But you can see that there's a problem here. If I go to w equals zero, there's some overall factor of the full 7D metric, which is basically shrinking and this leads to some nasty uh, curvature singularity at this point. Um, but the nice thing is that we can interpret this. So again, you can actually, now if you're given an explicit solution, you can actually compute this uh, charge for this flux. And you do find that it's this chi d minus this extra piece here. And you can also compute the R symmetry directly using the supergravity solution. And you indeed find that it's twisted uh, with the parent symmetry and this uh, uh, rotations in this disk. And this is precisely what ha was happening in, for these irregular, irregular punctures in uh, class S. So now you've got your 7D solution. You can try and uplift, uplift this to 11D on this S4. And your solution takes this kind of uh, ugly-ish form of it's basically uh, a torus with an S2, which is fibered over some rectangle given by these L1 and L2, uh, which has this form here. So we had two different special points in our 7D theory. We had this point where we had this curvature singularity, and this turns out to get mapped to this red line here. And this curvature singularity remains curvature singularity in 11D, but the nice thing is you can interpret this type of singularity as being a smeared M5 brain, which is lying along ADS5 times uh, this U1R symmetry direction uh, and smeared along two directions in the transverse space. So this is quite nice that you've had something which naively you would have wanted to throw away in 7D, but it has some nice uh, singularity, which you can actually interpret as something physical. And this is actually going to be the reason for having this irregular puncture. It's precisely that you have this smeared brain giving you this type of singularity here. The other point was this uh, R2 mod ZK orbifold point. And what happens is it sort of gets resolved. So you no longer have R2 mod ZK. Uh, you end up with this R4 mod ZK instead. And this is typically what you'd call uh, uh, an N equals two puncture. Uh, 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 for, for these types of theories. So you have uh, that ADS5 times S2 times this R4 mod ZK at this point. And this is really going to give you some type of flavor symmetry in your theories. So in this work by uh, Barbonetti, Manassian, and Nardoni, they conjectured that this particular solution that they had was dual to some DPA theory with some particular regular type uh, puncture uh, and the goal in uh, my first paper was to try and extend this to consider arbitrarily Higgs uh, punctures in these DPA theories. So you can reduce all this problem to basically studying this uh, line charge lambda. And what you end up with is that lambda can be built up into two different uh, pieces. You have this regular piece that characterizes the regular flavor symmetry. And then you have this irregular piece here, which is basically telling you information about your regular puncture. And given that you have some nice uh, linear equation, it's just the cylindrical Laplace equation, uh, you can now just sum up these building blocks. And if you do it in a smart way, 
you can basically generate a solution which has arbitrary uh, puncture. So what you need to do here is these points I correspond in this young diagram description of this uh, partition of N as the positions here. Whereas when you want to sum up this regular piece, if you multiply it by this MI here, uh, you end up with the type of flavor symmetry associated to this uh, I. So this is completely general. You can do play with it as much as you want. And uh, what you end up with is you end up uh, with something like these linear line charges here, which precisely map over into having this arbitrary nil potent Higgsin of your flavor symmetry. So the only constraints are that at some point this line charge is zero at zero. You can always shift this eta to make this happen. And then it has to always come down at some other point P. And this P here can be interpreted as the P that appears in uh, your poles for this irregular puncture here. So this P here is precisely the P in this eta uh, coordinate where this um, uh, line charge comes back down to zero. So this is a uh, part of the dictionary for, uh, basically you can get the full dictionary from this. Uh, P is uh, uh, just the root of where this lambda is zero and the MIs and the Is are either the location of the kinks and these MIs here get it interpreted as the change of slope at these kinks for this line charge lambda. So there's a very nice dictionary between the two of how to map uh, from the field theory and the supergravity uh, in this case. So there's one of the nice things that we realized uh, uh, later was that you can, uh, in this talk by Palash uh, two weeks ago, he mentioned he talked about how there's redundancy in this Argyrus uh, Douglas A type theory landscape. So if you had these DP theories with this partition of N for this uh, SUN and you had some uh, young, uh, some partition Y, this is actually equivalent to this DP N plus PL, where you modify also this flavor symmetry by adding in uh, PL uh, is, is in columns. There was also this second one, which is a bit uh, is a bit more uh, a bit different, which is that you take again the same theory, and what you happen, what you do now is that you take a PL where L is the sum of the flavor symmetry ranks minus your N and you take the conjugate for this Young diagram. And we can actually realize both of these uh, redundancies directly in the supergravity solution. And it's actually quite simple. So for the first one, what you should do is you should take this line charge that describes uh, this theory here, and you should add to it uh, this L appearing here and this lambda regular E to P. So what this is doing is it's giving you some kink at this point P, given this lambda regular. So the space time is really ending at this E to equals P here. But what you see that this redundancy is doing is basically giving you a slight boundary condition at this point. So it's telling you whether delta, the chain uh, derivative of lambda is basically a delta function or not when you evaluate it here. So if you want this first theory uh, here, you basically continue this red line uh, as a straight line. And if you want this other theory here, what you should do is you should add in an extra piece here, which basically continues this line down. But really all it's doing for you is giving you some delta source function, a delta function source here. And this is precisely how you can actually realize that these two theories are actually equivalent from supergravity. So this is pretty cute. It's very uh, simple actually. And the second one is uh, is also pretty easy. What you do is you, rather than having eta, lambda of eta, as a function of eta, you basically flip it. So I take this uh, line charge that I have here, and I basically uh, flip it uh, along this axis and then shift it by P. And this is precisely realizing this second uh, redundancy that was noted in this paper here. So supergravity is pretty powerful. You see this redundancy in a fairly trivial way in that it's some line charge and you're just playing with the line charge which preserves the, the solution. So the first uh, problem that we have now is that 
we seem to have this line charge here and naively guys Madesena tell us that really we should be able to draw some quiver for this uh, and then we somehow have re uh, removed this non-Lagrangian-ness of these AD theories. So the get out of jail free card for us is that these ranks of these line charge, the slopes of this line charge are no longer integer, which is what Gaeta and Madesena require. And there's absolutely no reason that you actually have to impose that they're integer unless you want these quiver theories. So what is happening now is that uh, their dictionary is that um, the rank of the gauge group is uh, lambda evaluated these kinks. But if this slope is, um, is non-integer, then what happens is this lambda that you get is also non-integer. So it means that this rank is somehow fractional and hence you can't actually write these Lagrangian uh, li linear quivers. So you can interpret this uh, in uh, a bit more, uh, a bit nicer way in that these M5 brains are wrapping particular circles in this torus uh, that you had in this supergravity solution. And when these RAs are integer, this is some regular uh, cycle that's being wrapped. And when it's uh, 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 rational, uh, what you're wrapping is something instead, which is quasi-regular. And this basically uh, gives you the difference between Lagrangian theories and non-Lagrangian. It's whether this cycle, this M5 wrapping, is regular or quasi-regular in this torus uh, vibration that you have in your solution. Okay, so this was problem one. We got rid of this... Uh, pesky issue that we thought we might have with being Lagrangian in a non-Lagrangian theory. But we also have another issue, which was we had this extra U1, which doesn't really get interpreted properly in uh, the field theory because it doesn't exist, it's somehow broken. So the first uh, computations in this BBMM paper showed that you could actually, if you do anomaly inflow, you see that this U1 symmetry is actually gets Higgs. At some point you get some uh, Stuckler-Berg mechanism and so it gets broken. But we should be able to see these directly in supergravity without actually having to do this anomaly inflow uh, business. And in this paper with uh, Peter, uh, Yane, and Siru, what we did was we modified this solution uh, to include an extra scalar. And this extra scalar is basically parameterizing uh, this, this scalar field that you have here for this Stuckler-Berg mechanism. So now that we turn this scalar on, we basically break this U1 directly in the supergravity solution. And what this requires us to do is to go away from this electrostatics picture and actually return back to this total uh, picture that we had in the initial uh, stages. So what we basically end up with is something which is slightly more difficult but we can directly see in the supergravity solution that this U1 flavor symmetry is basically not there. We completely remove this by adding this scalar. One interesting point though, is that at this regular puncture, we somehow need this scalar to disappear uh, because we need to get this flavor symmetry back and it somehow gets embedded in this R4 mod ZK. And what you do find is that the uh, well-defined solutions of this equation, which you now need to solve, are basically the ones that precisely do this. They basically set that this scalar at the boundary here basically goes to becomes trivial again, and you end up with this enhancement of this symmetry back so you can get this flavor symmetry. So this equation that we have to solve here is actually uh, somewhat uh, non-trivial. Uh, so what we had to do was we had to resort to numerics and you get some nice numerical pictures here where you can do the exact numerical solution for the uh, exact numerical solution for this equation, or you can do expansions around each of the different endpoints, and you see that um, they agree well. So this orange one is the expansion around W equals zero. It agrees very well until about here. And conversely, the blue one is the expansion around this endpoint one, and it agrees very well until uh, this point here. So the, the natural thing is to try and interpret this U1 as some remnant of this mirroring from the M5 brains. Uh, and what we're trying to do really here is rather than have these smeared M5 brains, which give rise to this irregular puncture, the goal was originally to try and actually fully localize the, these M5 brains. So this solution that we find doesn't quite do this. They're still somewhat smeared, 
but they're smeared in a less uh in in a less less than compared to the previous solution. One interesting point, uh, which I'll come back to in the conclusions, is that for these spindles, you can try and do similar things by turning on these scalars, uh, but you find that this is actually impossible. And the, what you should learn from this is that rather than having these extra, you actually are forced to have these extra U1 flavor symmetries in these spindle solutions, uh, whereas in this disk and this Argyrus Douglas theory, uh, this isn't required. So in this uh, final paper with Monica, Craig, and Yane, uh, we looked at generalizing this to uh, these ABCD theories. Uh, so the, the nice first one to start with is rather than taking the A series 6D theory, you start with the D series, and then you can possibly add punctures. Uh, but now you can just do the simple thing of taking the D series, compactifying on the CP1, and see what happens. And what you can immediately notice is that this requires you to introduce some form of Z2 orbit folding uh, in your parent uh, theory, and this re reduces down into these new ADS5 solutions too. So there's actually four types of this Z2 orbit folding we can do. Uh, so you have either it's R5 mod Z2, where this M5 braid is wrapping this S1, or it's this R5 times S1 mod Z2, and then this is further refined by either having uh, M5 brains uh, on top of this plane, in this case here, or located a fixed point, some fixed point here. Uh, and so you end up with four different uh, types. And this precisely corresponds to the four different uh, DP BCD theories that you can have. So everything follows through quite nicely, except you have to make some uh, global modifications to the solution. So rather than having this S2, what, gets, what happens is you have to replace this with RP2. And sometimes this circle, depending on what type of orbit fold you have, you have to do a further Z2 quotient of this circle. So you end up with a slightly new dictionary in that you have to modify this irregular puncture uh, line charge piece by this extra constant here and what was a simple N over P here now becomes B over some field theory uh, in, uh, SG, from some the field theory constant SG and this other field theory constant M. But once you do this, you find that this basically perfectly describes these uh, BCD theories. So in actually trying to compute observables here, you get some slight subtlety in that when you try to um, do these orbit folds, now the quantization condition of your four form flux is not just the simple integral of G4, it gets additional contribution from this uh, fourth uh, uh, Stifle-Whitney class here. And what this leads to is when you actually compute observables by doing some anomaly inflow, you get these extra shifts, uh, which is this alpha i here, for these observables. So I've given you the simplest one, which is the difference between C minus A. It's very simple. You have, again, some field theory uh, data, which is either a half if it's a USP or one for SO and, S, uh, and SU. You have these MIs, which were just multiplied by uh, these uh, uh, regular line charge blocks by. And then you just evaluate this line charge at this point I and possibly shift with this alpha i, depending on whether you get non-trivial contributions from this uh, Stifle-Whitney class. The other nice thing, which I mentioned briefly earlier, was that these orbit folds, there's consistency conditions that you can have. So you can have this, uh, uh, this fixed plane here, but there's only particular choices you can have for M5 brains intersecting it. And these M5 brains that intersect it are precisely the ones which are giving you this flavor symmetry. So this is called something called the T rule, and it's precisely this which is giving you the partition conditions. So for this R5 mod Z2, you cannot have an odd number of M5 brains which are acting transverse uh, to this fixed plane. And this is precisely the condition for the partition. So you get this nice uh, way of realizing these partition conditions precisely from consistency uh, conditions for these orbit folds. 
So we tested our solutions basically with this extra modified lambda regular uh, and this shift because of this uh, non-trivial stifle Whitney classes. And for rectangular punctures, uh, partitions, which is all we uh, considered, we found that we got uh, perfect agreement both to leading and subleading order with the field theory of results. So this is somewhat non-trivial. You really have to be careful about these alphas here to get these subleading pieces. But once you do this, you get this very nice match. Uh, and even in the A series class, we could actually get order um, sub subleading stuff if we really wanted to. Um, so it's actually very powerful and it's getting very good. So you can try and play these redundancy claims here for these theories. So now you have these uh, uh, BCD theories, you have probably some uh, more redundancy claims which match this A series that Palash talked about, uh, but it's not something we considered uh, in this paper, but it may be something uh, useful uh, for the uh, future. So just to conclude as I'm almost uh, running out of time, uh, we looked at these holographic duals of this Argyrus Douglas theories from class S, and we found explicit duals for basically all type one Higgs DP ABCD theories. Uh, and we can do lots of powerful checks. Uh, I didn't mention these before, but you could do all, uh, all the central charges. You could look at dimensions of some particular BPS operators, and you could probably do even more, which we didn't actually check yet. But they all agree to good uh, at subleading order, which is a very non-trivial check. It's beyond this nice, uh, beyond just uh, leading order. And the nice thing that I, I like the most actually is that you could see this redundancy that Palash talked about uh, a few weeks ago in a very, very simple way. It's just some redundancy in this line charge that we have, uh, which is very simple to see from supergravity, but is a lot uh, harder to see from field theory. And we can use this construction to further probe these theories using supergravity. Uh, so for some uh, future directions and maybe some, uh, it's probably quite hard, some of these, but can we actually see these type three punctures uh, from gravity? So what we expect is that there are some more singularities from these solutions. So whereas this type one had this kind of domain like this, what we expect is that type three has this funky bits here. So this, this leg here was, this, was dependent on this line charge. And what you end up with is you get some line charge here, some line charge here. And this bit here is telling you about these matrices T, which are classifying this type, uh, type three punctures. So this is quite uh, far off at the moment, but it's, quite nice that I think we can see these type three punctures from gravity. And they're actually probably a lot more simpler to study in this way than probably from field theory. Uh, a second one would be to actually construct these explicit flow solutions from the different uh, Higgs theories. And you can also try and look at uh, Higgs in the regular puncture using this kind of uh, setup. Uh, and moreover, you could also look at defects within these AD theories. So we constructed some uh, trun consistent truncation on our solutions down to 5D uh, supergravity. And in this theory, we can look at defects uh, uh, solutions. And from this, we can study defects within these Argyrus Douglas theories. Um, but if you don't really want to know about M5 brains and you want to do something a bit more different, you can also try and consider these 4D uh, super young mills and ABGM on these punctured sphere. So supergravity solutions are known here. They're pretty simple, uh, but the field theory duals of these are completely unknown. And be interesting to try and actually generalize these supergravity solutions that we have and actually identify these field theories, including this 4DN equals one SCFT that you should get from M5 brains on a spindle. Okay, thank you for your attention. All right, let's thank Chris. Do we have questions? I have a bunch of, but they're very ignorant questions. So if somebody else has a more something more pointed or intelligent to ask. I'm course. happy with ignorant questions. So. Okay, so uh, uh, the, this piecewise linear lambda function yep. 
in the I didn't follow the geometry at all. So somehow it's associated with the these discs and spindles, or maybe it's only the discs in this case. Um, and so, what's so. the in the geometry? How do I? Where do the discs come? How into do you the... see? Yeah. Uh, so, okay. Uh, so the, the disc comes into here because you see that it's from this four D. Uh, sorry, from this rectangle. The disc geometry is basically that you have this kind of singularity here and some other singularity here. And topologically, you see that it's actually an S2 fibered over an S4. It, it's slightly non-trivial uh, to see this. Uh, and it really relies on different types of boundary conditions for this uh, metric, which I skimmed over. Um, but basically, you can see that different pieces of these, these Vs basically die, uh, shrink and go crazy at different points. And this is basically showing you that the topology of it is really something like S4 fibered over some S2, where this S2 has these uh, funky punctures. So, so it's some like suspension of S4 over S2, and at the at these edges or something at these singular points, that's where you see the disc. Uh... Um, yeah, basically, it, it, you you really see the disc behavior comes about because of these uh, these singular points here. Like this singular point here is really this uh, conical singularity of the disc, and this smeared bit here is really the the boundary of this disc that you have. And w when you say a conical singularity, you always wrote them as orbifold singularities. But can you have uh, more general conical singular? So. Uh, I, yeah, I've, I've been thinking about this before and um, I don't know how to do it beyond this uh, orbifold singularity at the moment. I, I think it should be possible. Uh, so one nice thing that we have at the moment is that you can try and do this uh, equivariant localization. So this can basically get away with actually having an explicit solution, whereas you can compute um, uh, observables you, from gravity just using uh, basically the topology. So it may be possible using this equivariant localization story to actually compute uh, things where it's not just these simple orbifold singularities, but something genuinely uh, beyond this. So where does the K in the orbifold, in the ZK of the orbifold, how is that encoded in, in, in Lambda? In, in the... Ah, uh, uh, so in the Lambda... Uh, well, I'm sorry. Uh, so, so lambda. If I have these two different lambdas here, this k right. is basically this m i here. Oh, you're you're saying so for for every th there is kind of a disk car uh, associated to to each uh, kink, so to speak, whatever change in slope so, in lambda is that so so okay uh, maybe I should uh, rephrase this. So what what happens is that if you have just one kink, this is precisely an R4 mod uh, ZK singularity. Mm -hmm. If you end up introducing more of these kinks, what you should really think about is I, I replace this R4 and it becomes tau nut somehow. And each uh -huh. of these kinks are where the circle of this tau nut is shrinking. This is like the proper right. realization of this uh, uh -huh. thing. Okay. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Do we have more questions? Hey, hi, I have one. Hi. 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 Hi, Chris. So, yeah, thanks for the talk. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to ask you something about uh, type three theories, because for some choices of the punctures, the resulting 4D theory is conformal, sometimes. Uh, it is not uh, uh, so. From the holographic perspective, uh, you have a you have a way to see this immediately, or uh, so by the construction, we immediately are at the SCFT point. Uh, so we, we're only going to see the ones which are uh, SCFTs. Um, yeah, this, reading off the dictionary is pretty difficult in these type three theories. I'm still confused about a lot of it, um, but I think you should be able to actually understand what is allowed and, okay. Yeah, you exactly. So you think that 
for some choices of type three data, there will be issues in constructing the default. Yeah, exactly. Default yeah, yeah, I think so. Like there will be there will be basically you just can't construct the solutions for these. Okay, I, okay, yeah. that might be. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I think this. Yeah, so that there, there, there's some other things that you can see from this. Okay, this is type one again, but you can see when you can Higgs things basically depending on when this you have this line charge. It becomes immediate from this line charge when you can Higgs things as well. So I expect that very similar kind of arguments work for this type three theories. It's just yeah, it's very preliminary preliminary right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Yes. So, okay. Okay. Good. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, I actually had an another question. You, you made a comment at the very end uh, concerning um, 40 n equals four. Uh, yeah. Super I did. I didn't understand what what you had in mind. Uh, so so now uh, you can look at some two uh, D two comma two theory, which is the four D theory compactified on this uh, punctured Riemann surface. Uh, so I know the, the supergravity solutions work exactly the same. The difficulty now, now is that really you have two Higgs fields to do this. Uh, but this 2D 2,2 theory is kind of of the same flavor as these Argyris Douglas theories uh -huh. in, in that it's compactification on this punctured sphere. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, no, I understand. Thanks. Okay, yeah, thanks. More questions? All right, then I would say let's thank Chris again. Thank okay. you. And we can move off the record.